from all our partners to enable all our people to be able to share in the vision of creating the entrepreneurial spirit and to create jobs for the future. If you had a chance to change the world, would you change it? If you had the chance to change Uganda, would you grab it? I already alluded to it. Entrepreneurs take the risks. They also can change the world to make this world better, based on their dreams. So why aren't we supporting them to change our country and make it better? Every single time we think about success in business, we think about Sudhir. We think about Patrick Bitaturi. We think about Karim Dembe and all the other people who've done great things in entrepreneurship, the late Mluana. However, any of you can change this country, especially if you can become an entrepreneur. And the high innovator is the call to action for you. Join us as we talk about the high innovator. But before I do so, let me share with you a story about Abraham. Abraham is an entrepreneur. And he has a very interesting journey on his entrepreneurship. He started off as a student who wanted to go and do medicine. He was a high flyer. He finished his A-levels with the equivalent of A-stars. And he wanted to go and do a medical, examine, a medical degree in the United States of America. However, as you know, in the States, before you join university to do medicine, you've got to do pre-med school. His professor advised him, after he had come top of his class, that maybe he shouldn't do medicine because he was a genius, actually. He was a gig, a tech gig. And he returned to Uganda after finalizing in the year 2014. And he started off by getting a business in tailoring, in fashion. He would measure all his friends' sizes dispatch this information to Taki, and they would make the suits and send them back to his customers in Uganda. And the business was thriving. He was making huge margins. But one day, you are a hard about him and brought down his business because they backdated all the taxes he was due to pay, and suddenly all his profit margins were gone. He had to rethink his strategy. So he tried his hand at vending water. The business was very nice, because at the time, the water business was largely driven by Cavera. In other words, the border border guys, you pack water, boiled, or whatever they do to it, in Cavera, and give it out in a distribution, distributed system. And that business was doing quite well. And then, one day, 
it all went wrong because government changed its view about Cavera. And suddenly the business that he was running of really distilled water wasn't making any more money. So he went back and talked to his family. They owned some land. And he said, Uganda is a fertile land. He'd done his pre uh, grad, sorry, pre med university degree in Florida, which is a big agriculture space, and he'd learned a couple of things there. So he thought, why don't I come back and do the same of what I'd learned in Florida and do agriculture? So he tried his hand at farming, and it did very well. Got all the artificial irrigation that you'd require, put together the greenhouses, and he started doing chilies and okra for export. And lo and behold, the European Union introduced stricter standards and banned some of Uganda's produce. And he was producing three tons of chilies and okra in a week and suddenly, he didn't have a market because there were no more exports. So he goes to Nakasero Market, who you all, which you all know about, and he started to get a market. And they told them, the Mugaga who sells a lot of Accra and green vegetables and chilies is sitting in that corner goes over to him and says, so how much do you buy in a week? Or how much do you sell in a week? Uh, the guy said, 50 kilograms. You recall, he was making three, t three tons a week. So anyway, to cut the long story short, that business didn't go well. So, what did he do? It was approaching very soon, and you'd heard about blockchain. You all know about blockchain? So he becomes a business consultant in a technological consulting company dealing with blockchain. And he started doing what everybody does, which is discovering and trying to sell Bitcoin to those who would like to invest in Bitcoin. 2018, as you all know, towards COVID, the market for Bitcoin tanks. And suddenly, he's wondering what to do. And COVID comes, he has to rethink. And he now sets up this ventures company that does financial trading and provides a platform for those who'd like to invest. Ladies and gentlemen, what do we learn from Abraham's story? Entrepreneurship is a game of persistence. Entrepreneurs fail, but they raise again. Entrepreneurship can be a viable career because unemployment is a serious problem. But entrepreneurship can be a solution. Entrepreneurship is a high risk, but it's also a high reward. Because when failed businesses result in poverty, how can we reduce the uncertainty around entrepreneurship? So, I'd like now to ask Abraham, before he comes here, I asked him a question when he came to see me. I said, what would you change 
about your life and your chances of success in entrepreneurship. I was really shocked by his answer. His answer was very simple. You've all heard about money, access to money. It wasn't a challenge for him that much. His biggest challenge, surprisingly, was access to mentors, coaches, and business development services, and the right advice in having to succeed at his business. Coaching and business development is the most needed. Investment advice also is a big part in meeting the needs or of making people that meet the right partners in order to be able to deal with them. So, where is Abraham today? This story is real. Abraham, please come to the stage now. So, tell us, so much failure, but you persisted. And we think you know what you really want to do. So tell us the story in your own words. Uh, good morning, everyone. So yes, you've seen the recap of the struggles that has been thus far. And I chose to take each opportunity to learn. And as I learned, I realized it's not something you can go alone. And then I sought out people who are more experienced than myself, people who had the connections I didn't have, people who could get me in the rooms where the advice was being given. And I soon realized the niche that I was passionate about. And that's when I started Utilis Ventures, a financial services company to try and solve some of the problems I myself faced as an entrepreneur. And along that journey, we realized that for several reasons, there was a lack of access to investing for the average Uganda. And this was a problem that Richard and many other people found to be true and pressing in Uganda. And since then, I have worked with a small team of people to build a digital investment platform that is being put through its races and doing rigorous testing before we go to market at the end of the year. And essentially, just as I'm sure every single person here has one of these, and hopefully you've put them on vibrate, um, we realize that smartphones are quite the enabler. We've seen a lot of developments to provide banking solutions on smartphones, to provide access to markets, to support farmers through technology. And now we want to use technology to change how investment happens, not just in Uganda and in the region. And by partnering with NSSF through the High Innovator, we are hoping not only to launch but scale this product in a way that can really be not worthy, so that the next time someone tells the story, they don't stop at, he picked himself up again and tried again. They'll now start saying, he made it, we helped him do it, and he's helping others do the same. So I'm really glad to be here, and if anyone wants to know more of the details, please reach out to me. But uh, watch this space, and Utilis Ventures and the Level Digital Platform is coming your way very soon and we'll be doing big things with the High Innovator program. Right. Thanks, Abba. You heard it from the horse's mouth. It's not made up. He's lived that journey a long, long 
journey full of experience, full of hope, full of entrepreneurial spirit, and full of risk, but now, hopefully, with the high innovator, that risk will be mitigated as he continues on this journey. How did I hear about Abraham? It's networks. Abraham heard about the high innovator and asked a friend to connect him to me. I was introduced to him. He spoke to me about his product. I was quite impressed. And I asked him all the hard questions that you normally would because there are a lot of people that come into my office until I was convinced that he was a serious guy. And then I introduced him to the High Innovator team. And that's how he got linked to the Outbox, who are the people who are helping him in making sure that he comes to market. So I'm very pleased that we already have a success story out of the High Innovator program. If you must remember one thing I say today, Remember this, that the high innovator will provide you with the knowledge, the basics of business online, self-teaching platforms to make, you, make sure that you make as fewer mistakes than Abraham did. The other thing that will give you at high innovator is the know-how. You will get support from innovation hubs, such as Stambik, Moobs, Shona, Outbox, Amara, Impact, UCU Mbale, Makerere, so that they can help you in bringing together your ideas to the market. And finally, know who, a network of strategic partners such as MasterCard Foundation, Stambik, Abitrust, InPipeline, GICA, Equity Bank, Ministry of Science, Innovation and Technology. So quite a good array of partners we've been able to line up on this program. Entrepreneurs are at the high innovator, have a chance to build something that grows this nation. We will make sure that we engage with them to ensure that the country grows and really benefits out of this program. We also believe that the ladies at the High Innovator have a safe space to change this country. We know that countries that have empowered women transform faster. We know that families where women are financially included do better. We also know that if we encourage women out there, they will come and join us so that they can make this course go forward to make sure that our country really develops and develops through this entrepreneurship innovation. The Innovation Hub at High Innovator, you can have a chance to help build and create a great investable business. NSSF is looking always for investable businesses, places where we can put private equity to make them better. One of the sad stories is that we don't have enough companies to invest in. We only have three companies we've invested in through the private uh, equity fund that we have. We've been looking, we've got a whole fund of almost 20 million euros that is meant to improve businesses in agriculture. And we continue to miss out on companies that are willing to have us invest in them. Most of our investments in equity are on the stock exchange. But a lot of the companies that are on the stock exchange are mature in that they've been there for a long time. All the new businesses, the new Bitatures, the new Mulwanas, the new Sudils, 
they aren't coming into the market to look for that private equity. We would like to encourage them to come and be part of this, but would like this business to be disruptive in approach so that it changes the world. You know, all the big companies in the world today, the Amazons, the Googles, the whatever you think about that has grown to increase the market cap of all the stock exchanges, they are disruptive businesses. They are businesses that were built by their owners at university where they saw a need, a problem, and provided that solution through entrepreneurship. But they were also disruptive. That's what we are looking for. That's where I would like to invest our money at the fund to be able to grow this country, create jobs, and make the country a lot better. As I go towards the end of my presentation, I'd like to invite financial partners to work with the high innovator so that they can, we can create a one-stop uh, one shop for business financing for African entrepreneurs. We can unlock the new financing opportunities for our entrepreneurs with big dreams. Can we cooperate with financial institutions and the financial community in helping out these small enterprises? Can we break down the silos that are currently holding back this transformation? I know that if all the financial partners within this country can come and join us, we can make a real big difference and change for all of us. So, I would now like to ask Patrick to come back so that he can explain how people can participate. And thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, Richard. Uh, mine is uh, an easy one, basically. How do you get into, to, to basically participate? What we are looking for, and Richard used the word disruptive, ideas, you've been struggling maybe for two, three years, and your idea, or you're working on, has three main attributes. The potential to have impact. The potential to scale it, then the potential to be sustainable. In other words, it will actually be profitable because that's when it's a business. So if you're out there and that's what you think you have, come and join us. We are willing to take that one step that will grow with you until the big guys come for you in terms of investing. So basically, the process is easy. Um, where is it? Oh, I don't know. oh, this is the one. Okay. All right. So basically, it's a four-step process. We also can come up with acronyms. Enroll. You visit our landing page to get started. NSSFUG.org slash high innovator. www nssfug.org slash high innovator. When you get there, you then will get into a training. We did a pilot, and, and the, uh, Alex alluded to it. What we found out is entrepreneurs get so excited about their idea. And if you had what Abraham saying, the surprising thing is he wished he had got a coach, a mentor, a training, more even than the money, because it would have been prepared much more. So we've basically designed a training platform. It has got eight modules. It's online, which means you could be in Moroto, Arua, Kalangala, Tororo, or by the way, you could be in Cairo, Johannesburg, and get on it and actually walk yourself through the idea. Very interactive. You learn a concept, and we've used what I will call Africans. 
Ugandan entrepreneurs, some you know. We try to avoid trying to bring the Americans, the Europeans, because sometimes people say, ah, uh -uh. no, no, it only works in Europe. No, but we have got entrepreneurs here, and there are examples there. So you log, you log on there, and you go through it. When you are done with that process, we believe it will be about 45 days. The first cycle basically will close it about June the 24th. Then we review your ideas. The good thing is the platform, by the time you are done, as you interact with it, it's actually like helping you build a business plan. So we review it, so then we, you apply for the seed capital. And as I'll show you a number of partners that you have, once you are admitting that program and the seed capital is there, we then walk through with you. We don't leave you alone. And we have partners to help us do it. Because the end of it is we want you to pitch your idea now to a venture capitalist, a private equity person who has more money than uh, that more money for your business, and then you can do that. So then you grow the business. So if you look at this, you say E T A G ETAG. So that basically what we want. Just remember that ETAG. Enroll, train, apply, grow. Simple steps for you as you can get in that process. ETAG. Uh -huh. Actually, the E is not electronic, but T is a bit. Huh? It works okay. All right, now, so that's basically the simple step. You go in there and you can actually go through that process. The pre, we call this a pre-acceleration when you actually log in for the training. It's free of charge. Now, the reason why we have partners across the country is because we know that some people may not have a smartphone or some people may not have internet. So the reason why we have hubs in all these rooms, that if you don't have that, you can actually go to a hub, get on their computer, and do the training so you can actually know. It doesn't matter what business you have. Just go there and then build your own capacity of knowledge and things to know so that we can actually move there. And I want to kind of talk a bit about our partners. We've got Standard Bank, Equity, UDB, and then we have ADA Trust. And actually, they are here. I think I can see um, Josephine Mukubia. She's <laughs> back there with Arbitrust, specialist in agricultural funding. So if you have an idea that you think, you come, then come through them. Stan Big Bank is here, I think. Uh, I saw them, yes, Stan Big Bank is back there, thank you. Uh, equity, and then Uganda Development Bank. These are the first signees. We know there are more that are going to come. What we are doing is getting, and they're willing to put in money into your idea, so that at the end of the day, you've got a mixture of equity and debt in your idea, because debt actually disciplines us. If you learn, as an entrepreneur, when you learn to pay back the money, you actually grow your business because at the end of it, you can actually apply for some more money. Now, all these are now the business equation centers, and they're all over the map. And let me say, the ones who are online, let me just make sure that online right now as they are, and they have got groups of entrepreneurs around them uh, to acknowledge them. We, are, we have Stanbic has got an equation center. Right now, they're in Kampala, Mbale, and Gulu, and they are listening to us as we are streaming this live. We've got Innovation Village, also in Kampala and Gulu. We've got Impact in Kanungu. We've got Makere University, of course, in Kampala, Outbox in Kampala, Moops in Kampala and Gulu. We've got Mbale UCU in Mbale. We've got another one in Soroti, and I think in Lira. So we are building it so that we can actually have this network of inspiration centers to help support a business in that area. And if you're there and you're an inspiration center, you want to join, please let us know so that we can actually do that. So the country needs bold heroes. Are you the one? And on that note, I'd like to welcome one of our key partners, Mr. Samuel Adela. He's a country representative, country director, from MasterCard Foundation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you so much for having me here. And uh, we don't take this for granted because um, MasterCard Foundation, when we visited Uganda to start discussing about Young Africa Works, we just bumped with one person, 
in a, in, a, in a meeting which he had no idea who we were, uh, what we do, but uh, he came to contribute ideas with my friend and uh, family to the foundation, uh, Patrick Bikazue. And then he saw, he followed us. And then we had a coffee meeting to discuss about what NSSF was thinking and what they wanted to do. Um, and Patrick Iota, he explained it. And that's where this partnership started. And I just would like to everyone know that, like uh, Richard said earlier, we talked about Abraham's story. It is about people. Organizations are not a thing. They are you know, full of people, full of visionary uh, people who have emotions, who have thoughts, and who have ideas uh, to make a difference in their own way, in, in their country, in their communities. So that specific coffee meeting uh, grew to the level of the partnership that we are talking about today, helping 500 um, startups to help them grow, and of which with potential will be scaled. And we wanted to create investable businesses that can bring a huge number of jobs to the country. Um, I just would like to start by telling you this story because people may have questions. Why MasterCard Foundation is working with NSSF? Um, I, I was asked this question many times. You know, how, how did this come? Because we're implementing Young Africa Works strategy. It is a strategy that um, creates access or enables young people to find dignified and fulfilling work. For 30 million young people across the continent. In Uganda, 3 million is our target that with our friends and uh, taught leaders in the country that we come together on a table and agreed that by 2030, we need to uh, enable 3 million young people, 70% of whom are young women to find dignified and fulfilling work. Um, here is what we agreed to do. Young Africa Works has three pillars. The one thing that both Richard and um, Patrick were repeating was the word disruptive. So the, one of the pillars is disruption. As you know, we cannot achieve a different result by doing the same thing over and over again. We need to do things business differently. Um, and if we need a different result, there is a need for a different approach. So that approach needs to help many Abrahams who are going through that challenge to catch them early on. So they, their um, you know, difficulty of that four or five years journey to find what they want is shorter than it is today. Uh, in, in Africa, I believe our problem is not resource. Uh, like, like Abraham said, it was not access to finance that he found very difficult. It is actually the skills. It is the mentoring, the coaching. It is to look at the role model who made it through and then learn from them. So we need to identify the challenge and address that in a disruptive way, meaning we need to focus on the right problem. There are many problems, but if we focus on the wrong problem, on the wrong challenge, we're not going to get it. We're not going to achieve that. The second pillar is scale. The literature says that 700,000 new job interns every year in Uganda, 700,000. But we are creating very few jobs you know, compared to the need it doesn't mean that the opportunities are not there. The need is huge, 
as well as the opportunities. So we need to plan to implement programs at scale. Um, the third pillar is systems strengthening. We're not going to you know, always depend on organizations that are not rooted in the country, in the, in the continent. We need to have organizations stronger, with stronger systems, to support, to create the ecosystem for these entrepreneurs in terms of finance, coaching and mentoring, and providing market and creating that network uh, and the needs that uh, helps them grow and become one of those organizations that we envision. Uh, we have examples of the Apple. We have examples of Amazon. Uh, so we can create them, but we need to create that ecosystem. That ecosystem should be created here, not elsewhere. And we, Ugandan, uh, African organizations need to develop their system. Uh, with, with NSSF, um, I said, you know, why, why we're partnering is, it's not because we met Patrick first, but there is a vision alignment. Uh, we have values alignment. Um, and also, there is potential alignment. We see a huge potential in NSSF. If we can unlock the barriers that they have and use their leverage, their, their resources, and uh, the reputation they have in, in the country, they can create a huge opportunity for young people to create and to find work opportunities. We have seven partnerships, including NSSF, uh, NSSF in Uganda, under the Young Africa Works program. And with these partners, this includes Innovation Village, we have the Private Sector Foundation, which is our anchor partner, because our strategy is private sector led. We have Goody Ledger Farm, uh, URDT, Equity Bank, and Goal International Uganda. All of these, if we can do things differently, if we can um, implement programs in a way that not only, um, you know, just create partnerships like it is before, but in a different way, it's uncomfortable, it's not the same, but it will give us a new learning, at least new learning will come out of it. And then that will help us move as a country a little bit forward. And um, this time, this year, 2021, we still are in COVID. We have vaccines, but we have also new variants. We don't know when it's going to end. And MSMEs were the first one that were hit very hard. But what's happening to them today? Are they the same MSMEs in 2019? Or are they different? Our studies is showing, you know, most of them, they just abandoned the, the previous one, started a new path. So new business uh, pathways are showing up. So I think we need to be up to speed with the evidence and where, uh, where they, the, their minds is uh, showing them, because they are entrepreneurs, they always create, and we need to, to, to work with them. Um, I would like to emphasize in the end one thing that Richard uh, in the end had a call to action. He called all financial institutions to come together to work for these entrepreneurs. I really would like to uh, call um, the financial institutions to just take this thing seriously because our economy is based on these small businesses and if we don't give them the right um, tools and the right um, access to services that they require, uh, we may not move, we may not uh, find the growth that we want within the financial institutions because they don't grow. They don't grow, they don't survive. That are the, the two problems that we see in this business. If you come together, 
uh, with NSSF's leadership or whoever leads this, and if we can sit together and if we can find a way of creating access to finance for micro and small businesses that are the majority in our, in our recent study, we saw that 80% of them are in the rural areas. And the majority are led by women. If we can come together, create a solution that caters for them, we will be in that on that table. And we will help you unlock the challenge that uh, you're facing. Financial institutions, it is expensive. Credit is expensive for, for small and micro business. Very expensive. How can we make it? cheaper, how can we make it accessible, and how can we make it inclusive? Women, refugees, and those who are living in the poor urban centers and remote rural areas. Um, I think um, the country has a great potential. We are in a great move the oil and other uh, coming up, and there is a movement. And I, we need to start talking about how we can leverage these opportunities to make sure that young people are more, see hope, and uh, jump on that, on that train. And uh, we have talked a lot uh, on different forums. I think the time is for action. And we are happy to be part of the action. And we are really grateful that we are invited. And uh, NSSF trusted us to become a partner and work together. And uh, we are honored to be here. Thank you so very much. And congratulations on the work. I think one more clap for the, all the presenters. I think they did a very, very great job. And uh, I, I think we're onto something here. We're we not, we are not uh, creating uh, uh, something that is not real. And what we want to do next is really probe how real this thing is. So we're going to have a, a, a panel discussion right now. Uh, and I, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Outbox, the representative from Outbox, uh, to come on stage here. I'd like to invite the representative of MasterCard Foundation and uh, NSSF Patrick. Uh, please come and we actually probe whether this thing is serious and how serious it is. So we, ha we have some questions which are coming through online um, and we will we'll host some of those questions. But the reason why we're doing this, this panel discussion is is because it's very important that we actually simplify our message about what we want to do. Um, some of you who are familiar with uh, Winston Churchill, he once wrote a very long letter to his wife uh, to explain a couple of things about what was going on during the war. A very long letter. And at the end of the letter, he apologized to her. He said, I'm sorry I didn't write you a short letter. I just didn't have time. Which is quite ironic, but the, the, the point being that we need to simplify the message. Simplifying a message is very difficult, huh? so we, we want to get to the core of the issue, uh, and, and that's what we really want to do. So, <clears throat> allow me to start my question um, with, with Angie. Angie Kerubo is from MasterCard Foundation. Uh, and Angie, I did not prep you for this question, but I'm going to send it to you anyway. We, we've had a lot of situations where um, development institutions, donors come with very interesting programs, and many of them are, end up being fads, things which people can talk about, but, uh, but probing the real substance, you don't find much. Tell us about Young Africa Works. Is this another fad, or this is something very, very serious? No, it's not a fad. Uh, and as Samuel said, it's a bold vision. It's gender transformational. We want to create 30 million jobs for young men and women in Africa 
in Uganda, we want to create 3 million jobs for young men and women. We have a lot of young people entering the job market. They're not getting jobs. It is not a fad. So we want to create the jobs now, and so the call to action is now. Our approach as the MasterCard Foundation, as Samuel said, is to co-create with local institutions, to build programs that we know will create jobs for young men and women, challenge the status quo. So for example, in the High Innovator Program, we're coming up with a program where we partner with hubs across Uganda to work with the entrepreneurs to come up with good business ideas. We are also inviting local institutions to come and invest in the businesses. So it is not a fad because we're doing it together as a family and as an ecosystem. So I, would, I wouldn't say it's a fad because we're doing it together. So no, it is a it's not a fad. It's a bold mission and we're looking forward to seeing the potential outcome. Thank you very much, uh, Angie. Um, I'll now turn my guns to Richard Zulu. Uh, since he's a warrior, let me ask him a, an even harder question. Uh, Richard, the, the innovation community, the, what we call innovation hubs, I mean, they've been around for some time. Um, I, believe, I believe Kenya is quite ahead of us in terms of, uh, of, of this community, but Uganda is, is not doing badly either. What is broken in the innovation hub community that we need to fix? And, and as far as this program is concerned, is there anything broken or what do we need to improve? Thank you very much, Alex, for uh, that question. Um, my experience in this community goes back close to, to 10 years. And... Uh, you know, over that time, we've seen quite a number of interventions coming in to support uh, the entrepreneurship ecosystem. Uh, but one of the things that we've gotten to appreciate is we are moving quite slowly, uh, very slowly. And there are many reasons uh, for that. One is the siloed approach in terms of solving a problem that is systemic. Uh, that has really kept us from moving very fast, where you see development partners trying to do their own thing. You see financial institutions trying to do their own thing. Um, and even those who partner with these institutions, the innovation hubs, are not in for the long haul. They look at it like a, a very simple box to tick in a work plan. Output one, we supported innovators. And so the, the high innovator approach that has systems thinking in terms of how do we move together with all the other actors, um, we believe if we test that hypothesis and actually make it work, we shall see quite some acceleration. Because we are, we are um, from, from everyone, we are trying to tell them to be bold from financial institutions it's not about us giving you money, and then when an entrepreneur comes, you say, oh, a high innovator gave me a chunk of money, let me de-risk them using that. No, it's about the institution as a whole. If you look at the innovation hubs, it's about saying, how do we sustainably build our capacity and offer support to entrepreneurs? So both looking at the supply side of building good businesses and looking at the demand side. And for me, uh, those, in short, that's my analysis um, as to why we're moving very, very slowly. Thank you, Richard. Uh, finally, let me turn uh, my guns to Patrick. And like everybody else, I'm asking questions which you have no uh, prior preparation for. And this one is a hard one. Why should NSSF be involved in this? Is it good value for, uh, for the members' money? This question will be coming, whichever way you look at it, and I think it's better we preempt it right now. So Patrick, is this good value for money? I think uh, if you, what Sam talked about, this country needs 700,000 jobs a year currently. I think the number that's being uh, created is between 80 to 90,000 jobs, which means there is a big gap between what the potential for the country is and what it is doing now. So now just look down the road. 
10 years from now. NSSF grows in, in only two ways. New contributions or our net surplus when our revenues are more than our expenses. Then we grow. Now, if you look at the environment today, our net income comes from the stock exchanges, which I talked about, comes from uh, our real estate, comes from our bonds that we've bought. The interest rates, interest rates are coming down on the bonds. Stock markets are, str are struggling. Real estate is a problem. So if you look down, then the other source of growth that would have would be new contributions coming from new members or people getting higher salaries. If you see what's happening in the country today, the big companies are innovating and automating. So in a way, the numbers are not growing as much. What they do is, if they get a chance when somebody leaves, they don't fill that position. So even if you have a salary increment, that net effect is offset by you not having as more people working as before. So the only chance to grow is new members. Now, if you're not as a country growing jobs, so in 10 years' time, where does NSF get its members? So strategically, when you think about it, and Richard talked about it so well, he says the only way you can predict the future is to create it. So we're creating a future of new members, of new businesses we can invest in so that the return to members grow. So it's strategically for us is that. So for the member, is one of the best things we can ever do as a country. That it can be bold enough and look 10 years down the road and say, let's create that future. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to entertain some questions from our online community. And uh, the first one is from John Ioana Alepa. I hope I pronounced your name well. And John says, thank you very much for this opportunity. But I'm asking, how can we be able to acquire loans from this association since we really need to expand simple businesses we have into bigger businesses? Um, Patrick, since you finished on, on disruptive businesses, why don't you take that question? Um, and that's a good question. I think we have a, we've put into place a system, and that ecosystem now includes financial banks, includes us, includes the, the hubs. So maybe for, specifically for uh, that individual, I think Ayelo, that's the name, just get the training, because that's how we are doing it. Go on the, go on the website, get yourself trained, work through your idea, work through your business plan. When it is done, and you get the high innovator, between us and the bankers it will be a mixture of grant and loans. So then you'll be able to tap into it. The first training is 45 days, which means if you are really serious, in 45 days, somebody could be looking at your plan, in which case then you can go in and see what happens. That's really the intent of it, so that we can help you, support you, be ready for a bank in terms of what you do. So will the bank be part of that process? Will it already be in that? Uh... Yes. In fact, uh, at least the three institutions I can mention, Arbitrust is here, UDB, uh, Stanbeck, and Equity. Part of what we are telling them to be embedded within the business so they get to understand that business. Because you cannot, and the, Sam talked about the credit. Credit is very expensive. You cannot underwrite that business using the normal credit standards. It's a startup, so it won't have your cash flows you're looking for. So you need to be able to milestone it so that as they hit those milestones, you can then release the money that you need for them. So they have to be embedded within the entire program. Okay. I have a second question from Wilson Muhammad. Um, and he, he is asking, who is funding the High Innovator Program and how much are you giving to the various businesses? I will have uh, Angie and Patrick answer this question jointly, uh, but probably, Angie, you can go first. Thank you. Um, so we are in partnership with NSSF, the High Innovator Program, and in total we've contributed or put together 35 billion Uganda shillings to support the 500 startups uh, over a five-year period. I will let Patrick provide the more details on uh, individual support to each of the businesses. So it was actually a match between NSSF to give that initial uh, capitalization. And as she said, about 35 billion shillings over the next five years. Now, which is about 7 billion shillings when you think about it uh, within, uh, within a year. 
But the advantage with it is now with the other financial institutions coming, what you find that on average, whereas a member could start off with, say, 50 million shillings or 70 million, depending on what it is, by linking now with the financial uh, institutions. Now we leverage on that, and now suddenly the member could actually be able to access up to 150 million shillings, depending on what uh, the business needs and how it actually works out. So we think it's actually a good thing in terms of leveraging that. Uh, Ivan Akampa, uh, he has a, a bit of a long question. So there is also this challenge, instead of supporting you grow ideas, it's an opportunity for the potential guys to steal the young boy's idea and bring it into existence. How do you intend to protect such ideas? I, I am glad we have someone from the Ministry of Innovation who is handling intellectual property. Um, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll ask uh, Richard to, to answer that question, and there's a follow-up question after that. But please go ahead. Thank you very much. Indeed, uh, intellectual property uh, is a big concern. But a lot of what we've seen is uh, within our community, uh, young people are very guarded about ideas. And uh, one of the things we tend to encourage is that it's the execution, the execution of bringing that idea into a business that matters. We all have ideas, but how are you guarding your business once you've executed that uh, idea? So within the, the, the program, you own your own intellectual property. We actually help you uh, protect your business uh, when it comes to your intellectual, intellectual property. And uh, in no way do any of the implementing partners uh, take uh, or steal your ideas, as, as, as you call it. We are here to facilitate um, and not to execute um, these businesses. I think one of the things that you just shall say is critical. What we found out with businesses is, uh, the, especially the startups, they need this whole ecosystem, what we call business development services. For example, you go there and you tell them, we need you to produce financial records. We need you to have an accountant. But the entrepreneur says, wait a minute, I, I, can't, I can't afford an accountant. So what we are putting together is basically uh, a platform where for a small amount of money, basically, that can be something that they also buy. Now, in the audience today, we've got a firm called KTA. And it's a law firm. And we hope they are going to be part of this uh, this platform, because then you can actually legally register your idea and protect it, and they are part of that ecosystem to make it work. Thank, thank you. So there's a follow-up question from Ivan again, and uh, the question is, does the high innovator support every kind of business? It seems it's a learning platform alone. Um, how about um, MasterCard Foundation? Young Africa Works, what are their key areas of interest? Uh, does it include tourism, construction, and agriculture? So I'll, I'll let Angie start, and Patrick, you can complement. So for this particular partnership with the High Innovator, we are going to start with businesses in the agribusiness uh, value chain. So that could be everything from on-farm all the way upstream to agro-processing, um, even um, support services. So agri-finance, for example, agri-tech, etc. And uh, we want to start with that because we want to learn and use that as an opportunity to continue learning. Uh, as the MasterCard Foundation broadly, based on the partners that Samuel had mentioned earlier, we were focusing on a few growth sectors that are also aligned with the National Development Plan 3 that the government has laid out. So agriculture is one of them, tourism, of course, construction, um, entrepreneurship, as we call it, MSME. But for this particular call, we're going to start with agribusinesses. Yeah, and, the, and, and that's basically aligned to exactly what we look at. We're following the National Development Plan, so we'll start with agriculture. What we learn on it then can bring another uh, vertical. Maybe it will be health or whatever it is. So that as we then we grow uh, together as we do that. So I think that's... So we have another question coming from Eric Mujona. And he's asking, uh, Richard, he's asking, how long must a startup have been in existence in order to qualify for funding? Okay. 
Uh, so, Jonah, um, the High Innovator Initiative is a, is a two-phased process. We have what we call the pre-accelerator, uh, and as was presented in uh, ETAP, <laughs> it is uh, the training component to help you fill some gaps in your business or idea and help you prepare for the next phase, which is the funding phase, which is the accelerator phase. Now, the, for you to qualify for the pre-accelerator, it's, it's largely open, as long as you know, you're, you're working on something um, as a business or as a team, registered or not, uh, you can undertake that initial support process, which is supplemented by support from our partner hubs uh, to help you prepare but to get into the, the accelerator, which is the funding phase, we look at a couple of things. One, you must be registered, uh, having been operational for at least two years. Um, you should uh, have a team behind you and not be a sole proprietor. Um, you should be in the agribusiness vertical uh, for you to qualify for that phase. Um, and also... Um, you should have a product or service where you've at least gen generated 20 million Uganda shillings over the last two years. Um, so the pre-accelerator is, is, is open and we don't stop you from participating in that because even if you're not in agribusiness to qualify for the funding, we are going to have more windows or calls open where you can participate. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. We have another quest, uh, question from Sechienje Wamala, and he says, thank you a lot. Why is it that whenever you want to register for such programs, they normally ask, Richard, why do they normally ask whether the business is registered? Most startups are not at registration stage, but have some very good business ideas. So what's the logic? Yeah, so every program has a, a target audience, and high innovator is catering to both. If you look at the pre-accelerator, if you're not registered, the goal is, again, filling in those gaps. When you go through the 45 days, you should be in position to at least uh, register. But the other point to note is that High Innovator is all about sustainability. It's all about growing businesses that have potential. And an entrepreneur who has skin in the game will have a vision that for me to invest or demonstrate that I'm invested in my business, I must be compliant. And when we talk about registration, it's very simple. It's you, you, URSB, Uganda Registry Services Bureau, and having a TIN number. And an, an NSSF number that you can get in under 15 minutes. Yeah, so we are trying to cater to both verticals. The pre-accelerator should help you prepare. We are here for the long haul. Um, and with multiple calls, definitely at one point, uh, you'll be ready. All right, we have a question from uh, Jones Breyer. Breyer. I hope that's the correct pronunciation. Good morning. Whom do we contact if we want to be part of the hubs? Uh, Patrick, who, who, who do they contact if they want to be part of the participating hubs? I think if you have got access to the internet, as I said, just go to nssfug.org slash high innovator and you'll find a list of the partners who are there because then you can tap into the one you think is closest to you and you'll read about them what their specialized areas are and they can actually offer you the support that you seek and to add to that uh, if you visit the the, the website um, you will also be uh, given contact details once you express interest uh, of who to contact and where uh, depending on, on, on how you complete uh, your expression of interest. Angie, there's an interesting question here from uh, Julian Nabunya. And what, what she's asking is, does the investment program target a specific age group? If so, what is this age group? And in answering that question, tell us a bit more about why this program is important for women as well. Um, let me start with why it's important for women. So, as we said, we want to create jobs for young men and women, 
but we know over time that women are often excluded from participating in the society. And so we want to exclusively ask them and encourage them to apply because we believe that if we empower women, we empower households, we empower our economy. So we want it to be specifically for women. Apply, be encouraged, you're going to get this a much support that you need. And as the MasterCard Foundation and the NSSF High Innovator Program, we're aligned to support women. Um, in terms of the age group, I think for the founders, we want to target people between the ages of 18 to 35. And um, I'll let uh, Richard and Patrick uh, co correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the target group. But also go within the, the metrics we've, me we've mentioned. So you're a business, you're registered, you're within the sector we've talked about. And also for those 45 days, please complete the pre-accelerator program. Yes. Okay. We... We are running out of time. I'll probably take uh, about three more questions uh, before <clears throat> we start wrapping up this program. Um, so, Ignatius, uh, Patrick Ignatius Okore would like to know how long will the online uh, training take? Uh, there are eight modules. Uh, so the question is, how fast can you work on it? If you wanted to focus on it, you could do it within 10, 15 days. But uh, the whole program, that fast, class that then graduates and is considered for funding uh, will be within 45 days. It doesn't mean it closes in 45 days. It just means that if you're not finished, then your application will not be considered in, that, in the next call. You'll have to wait until you've done that. Okay. Okay. For, for those whose questions we have not been able to answer, we will answer them online. But let me just uh, push two more questions through. Um, second question coming from Ronald to Musime, kindly take us through the program application process and requirements. I think, uh, Richard, very high level, just, just do this for, for, for Ronald to Musime. I, I, know, I know Patrick had already done something online, but just very high level, uh, take us through. So Patrick, just uh, visit www.nssfug.org slash high hyphen innovator, high innovator. Uh, go to the website, read through it, then uh, express your interest. Once you express your interest, you receive an email that contains details of your assignment in terms of which partner hub is going to support you and how do you contact them. Uh, and also you receive access uh, to the pre-accelerator course. Undertake the pre-accelerator course, not just skimming through it, but actively applying the exercises in there and come out with a business plan. Thereafter, your partner hub will conduct a very quick due diligence uh, regarding uh, how you've done the course and what you've submitted to determine if you're eligible for the accelerator. Then you'll be invited to the accelerator where you'll go through a selection process. Um, and once you're confirmed, you get six months of uh, support. Okay, thank you very much, our panelists. I think to close this session, we would like to hear from uh, the innovation hubs and they're going to actually call in live from where they are. So I'd like to first call uh, Jail, Jael, I hope that's the correct pronunciation, from Outbox Hub, Kampala. Please go ahead and uh, ask your question or make your remark. Okay, uh, let's then move on to Alvin of Impact Hub, Kanungu. Can you call in from Kanungu and make your remark, please? No, wait, no. Hello, good morning. My name is Jackson Wamanya. I'm calling from Impact Hub, Kanungu. My question is, uh, you mentioned about supporting a good business. So, if I'm an entrepreneur and uh, I'm involved in a good business, will, you know, will high innovation support me at all stages of the value chain? 
or a thorny value addition stage. For example, if I'm involved in passion fruit growing, would you support me to grow my farm production or you only interested when I begin processing and packaging juice? Thank you. Over. Patrick, why don't you take that question? Uh, actually, you put, you see, the way you do your business plan is this. You're growing it for who? It's possible that you've identified a buyer from your end, a viable buyer. What they don't have is a supply of that side. So as a business, you're saying, I need support here because I do have a verifiable buyer on this end and becomes part of your, uh, part of your business plan. Many times we start, and as a Ugandan, we start doing things, we plant things because we had now, the, the big hottest thing in Uganda today is planting avocado has avocados. But when you ask who is going to buy it, you're not very sure. That's not a very viable business plan. So you go ahead, but imagine, just assume, if you're not the consumer, you've identified a customer who is going to do that. Then we look at the whole plan, because the idea is for to make it sustainable. Uh, Simon Okello from Innovation Village in Northern Uganda, please ask your question. Good morning. I hope you can hear us. Um, my name is Simon Okello, uh, Regional Manager, the Innovation Village, Northern. Uh, the question here, and this question is from the members that are, are watching. Uh, in our watch party here, is that uh, how uh, are we going to equitably uh, distribute this fund to all regions to avoid over concentrating it in one region, say Central or Kampala? Uh, because their concern is that, uh, yes, we are in a global world, but the challenges facing these two, that these two uh, different places face are also different. The challenges faced by the innovators in Kampala may be the same, but uh, there's a slight difference in, 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 the, in, in them actually. Uh, the, north, the people in the north, they have their peculiar differences from the central. So how equitably are we going to distribute this fund that all the regions tap into? Thank you. Uh, Richard, why don't you take that one? Okay, um, so part of our strategy as, as high innovator is to work with uh, local ecosystem builders. For instance, in Kanung, we are working with Impact, and they are very well versed with the community and understand the challenges that are faced uh, by these entrepreneurs. So our goal, and this is why we have this first phase uh, of the pre-accelerator, is to ensure that we work with you as an entrepreneur over the next five years and help you grow, okay? Help you grow so that you can demonstrate potential, you can demonstrate sustainability, and you can demonstrate scalability, okay? Uh, but the criteria has to be applied equally, but we understand that some areas need more support than others, and we are very deliberate about being inclusive in terms of how we identify these entrepreneurs and support them. Secondly, High Innovator, by its very nature, is designed to work with you uh, as an entrepreneur, looking at those small seeds uh, of entrepreneurs that have potential uh, and helping them upskill uh, and move to the next level. Yeah. And maybe one thing that is, uh, I think we just named a few of the hubs that we have. Over the next three, uh, four years, we, need to, we are going to expand that to at least 20. So there are more of them uh, out in the countryside to provide that kind of support uh, that they may need. So the, we are very cognizant of the fact that certain areas that are lacking right now, so we'll build up that gap as we go through it. Super. Uh, Alan Lule from MIC. Makere Incubation and Innovation Center. Please ask your question. All right. 
good. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, I think from Mick, we have uh, people asking questions here. We have only those. Yeah, uh, I would start by thanking you for this program. Uh, my, my question is, uh, you have had one of the panelists talking about uh, this program basically targeting uh, businesses that have been in existence for at least three years. And uh, me and my colleagues, we are just university students, and we'd like to take on our idea, our business idea as a career. So uh, is, there there, like, uh, is there any room for, for us participating to the final stage? Thank you. Uh, thank you very uh, much. Uh, I will uh, I'm also, yes, I want to supplement on that question. I'm called Rogers Mukalede from uh, Shabit, Uganda, here at MIC. Uh, so I've been reading the guidelines, and it was saying that the company must have been in existence for at least two years, and um, it must be registered. Now, do you consider the time from when it was registered? Because some companies, um, uh, before this, we like for us started operating, uh, then we just registered last year, but we have operated for more than uh, for like three years. So that's what I wanted to to clarify to get clarification. Otherwise, thank you very much for the. Uh, thank you. I think in the uh, uh, Richard mentioned that in the pre accelerator stage, the registration is not a requirement because you can get in. Um, and then, hopefully, because one of the things that one of the modules talks about the whole idea about formalizing your business, being compliant. Hopefully, by the end of that 45 days, you've actually realized the need to register. If you can prove that you registered last month, but you've been there for the last two, three years, yeah, we'll look at you. I mean, that's the, that, that's, it's not, it won't be defeatist to do that. The only thing is you have to be able to show us that actually you were there before you registered and been working on it. Yeah, then on the question regarding uh, being a student and having ideas. Um, high innovator, you should look at high innovator as being part of a system. What do I mean? Um, these institutions that we are working with, the incubation hubs, have quite a lot of programming in terms of helping individuals with uh, ideas, uh, grow those ideas into products and grow them into uh, businesses. So that's one avenue um, uh, you should tap in as a student, uh, looking at the partners we're working with, what are some of the programs they have. The second is the pre-accelerator, which is the first phase uh, of, uh, of you joining uh, the program. Uh, the pre-accelerator allows you to still go through uh, the different modules uh, and practice and kind of realize your idea into a business. So definitely it's still open to you, but you need to have a mindset of running a business not a project, uh, but a business. Uh, because when you get to the accelerator, we are focused on businesses. Okay, last two questions. Uh, to Sime Joel from Moobs, uh, and uh, the last one will be from Misach from UCU Mbale. So in that order, please ask your questions as we prepare to close. All right, if the questions are not forthcoming, then uh, we can close this session. Hello? Hello, um, hello. this is Remy from uh, Macquarie University Business School, uh, the Entrepreneurship Innovation and Incubation Center. Uh, we're just here to appreciate our partners for the launch as the program speaks to actually what we do here at the center. We are really focused on ideation uh, because of the bulk of students that come in. So this is a feeder into our MOOBS uh, startup garage. 
And uh, we want to thank you for everything, our students and the community around. We know that uh, this is a project that's going to take us a mile. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Remy. Uh, Ms. Arch, if you're still there, ask your question before we close. Ms. Arch from UCU in Bali. All right. So thank you all very much. It is, we, have, we are coming to the, the, the close of the program. Panelists, you, you may take your, your seats. Uh, Patrick, don't go too far. Thank you so much. So as we close the program, uh, I'd like to call someone from, from amongst you to give us some closing remarks for five minutes. They, they say that uh, the best ideas for business usually start in a restaurant, the bath, or the bar. The problem with the bar is most of the people who have inspirational ideas forget what they were thinking about. Samuel Adela told us that uh, this idea started uh, at a breakfast meeting, and I think it's only fair that we, we can adduce that without uh, the, the intervention of Patrick Bitature, we might not be here today. So I'd like, Patrick, just give us some five minutes of your wisdom. Uh, wisdom is a cherished asset, and so when we have the benefit of having it, uh, just give it to us for five minutes only. I know you get, you, you get a lot of this these days, so please just give us five minutes of your time, and then I'll ask Patrick to come and close the session. Thank you. Very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I was not expecting to say something today. I said that I should sit and listen and learn, and there's a lot I've learned this morning. I must begin, first of all, by thanking Sam, Sam for the very kind words, because there are very few people, and I mean this when I say, there are very few people in this world who think like this man you see here called Sam from MasterCard. When they came to talk to me first time about this change, I think I was head of the Private Sector Foundation of Uganda. And I've met so many different groups of well-meaning people, especially from the first world. They come and they want to make a difference. They will come and they want to have social impact. So mainly from America and from Europe. We talk to them, but in my lifetime, the last 30 years at least, very little impact has come. Why do I say this? I recall when AIDS hit Uganda and we turned around, we didn't know what to do. And nearly every family lost somebody. And we looked left and looked right. Then the president of America at the time, President Bush, set up the PEPFA fund. They couldn't cure AIDS, but they'd give us medicines to keep our brothers and sisters sustainable, alive. And that fund, until today, the biggest donations that come to Uganda through that Gavi fund have made a very big difference in the lives of so many people. To me, that was a fantastic humanitarian act done by the Americans. And I will always say that because many of us take it for granted. But without that intervention, we would not be where we are today. Now, when it came to jobs, we had moved on 25 years. And I could look around me. My life has changed so much in the last 30 years. But I look at so many young people, and they are beginning to lose hope, completely lose hope. And we see this challenge of the fast-growing, young, youthful population, full of energy. But many of them are getting misguided. Then I met Sam Adela. We sat and talked. And I thought, yeah, I brushed it off. They said, we want you to come. We talked, and I was passionate about what I mean, about how we can change people's lives. He said, I want you to come to Canada. Me? I've traveled the world, but I've never been to Canada. Canada to me is very far. It's cold most of the year. Yeah, good things about them. They are nice people, but that's about it. I said, I'll come. I'll think about it. Then, oh, time came. I don't have a visa. They insisted. We're postponing the meeting. We want you to come. And they now chose a group of Ugandans to come with me. I said, what's wrong with these people? We'll send you a business class ticket. We'll send you a... I said, I don't need your ticket. But we want you to come. Eventually, I mustered the courage. I got on a plane to 
Canada. Then I sat in a room with these amazing people, just as passionate. Like there are six or eight, maybe 10 people. They had a big office, back office, but the room we sat with, they are saying, how can we solve your problems in Africa? That's why I was skeptical. You can't. Then they said that we have a war chest. We've been researching, and we are very determined. And now we have zeroed in in Uganda. We are coming to Uganda. We want to create 3 million jobs. We'll begin with 300,000. We'll break it down. These people blew me away. They changed my perspective. Like how when you come from being a non-Christian, now becoming a Christian. That's how I changed from darkness to light. They were so determined to come here. I was fired up. We spent two days locked up in rooms, or three days locked up in rooms, and I got back on a plane to come here. My life was changed then. It was no longer about me or my businesses, but how can we change this trajectory? And I started knocking on the doors, Prime Minister, His Excellency the President, the First Lady, to get this message across. Everybody was listening, but like me, mm, we've had these stories before. Is this going to happen? This man got on a plane, came here, set up office, and said, let's begin looking for the right partners. We're going to make this difference. What a wonderful man this guy is. Please. <laughs> there are good people out there. We have been waiting for Jesus to come back. Jesus may not come back in our lifetime. But some people are going to come and we're going to change this world. But we need to work with them. It's us to make the effort. Others, we can have these beautiful workshops, talk, 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 touch a few people's lives. One year they're in business, next year they're out. No, that won't work. We need to move the needle, really to move the needle. We need socioeconomic transformation. If we don't, we've got a problem. We're sitting on a time bomb. These countries that you see have gone into civil disruption, cannot be organized, that's coming for sure. Because the youth, when we now we are at 40 million, 50 million, 25 years from here will be 100 million. And that will be a lot harder to manage. So I call upon you to call on your MPs, to call on your local leaders, to call on your religious leaders, to get together in this new crusade. It doesn't take away from the other crusade that was brought by Christianity or Islam. This is a new crusade of creating jobs. We've got to stem the hemorrhage of these young people going on these flights at night to Dubai, to Saudi Arabia. It's better than the West Africans who are trying to go across the Mediterranean and are dying every day. But we've got to do something different today. In the first world, in America, in UK, I know that the banks are lending money, the London interborrowing rate, LIBOR, is below 1%. Here it's at 18%. Which young guy can start a business at 18% and pay it back? We've got to fix these problems. I was talking with Sam this morning. How do we fix the element of trust? There is no trust in our society. And a society cannot grow without the element of trust. That's the glue that holds us together. We don't trust the banks, they don't trust us. We don't trust the government, they, doesn't tr they don't trust us. We don't trust one another. We are going to be like cockroaches in a bucket. We've got to change the trajectory. Before, there was no infrastructure. There were no roads, there was no electricity. So you talk about good ideas, but it wouldn't happen because you didn't have the power. You couldn't create factories, you couldn't create the jobs. Today, most of the roads have been built, nearly every part of this country. Electricity is going to most places. So now we can do the thing about moving human capital in the right direction. We have plenty of land, fertile soils, good weather, gifted by nature, but we are still so poor. When you see countries like Japan, a country with no resources, Korea, South Korea, no resources, but see how powerful they are. They invested in their human capital. We need to do something. Farming is a fantastic business, and I urge those who are in farming to continue. We need to increase our production and productivity. Farming is like a mother as an industry. It will never say no. St. Bernardo's home. All of you, you are welcome. Come, come, come. But very many of you will remain in poverty. We need to get people doing business, to think agribusiness, to do value addition. That's how we shall change the people in our society. This community will not be lifted until we do things better. I am so grateful to NSSF. They are sitting on a huge pot of money, but they cannot move it on their own. You need to put pressure on your MPs because it affects parliament. They will pass legislation. They will get out of the strict jacket they are in. They can only do this and that. Give them more latitude. If they do that, more people create jobs. Those people all will register for NSF. Save with NSF, the pot gets bigger, and they can help more people. It will become a vicious, a virtuous circle. The same with URA. We've got to get these government bodies to trust us, and we work with them. 
and young businesses, we, would, we should be supporting them, not just with money, but mentoring them, training them, seeing the pitfalls. Because there are so many pitfalls. I tell people, business is extremely hard. People think business is easy, and especially at graduation, they are telling all the young people to go and start businesses. They are just throwing them into the sea. Business can be fantastic. You must be passionate. You must follow your talent. But it's hard, and there are many pitfalls, and you're going to fall down, but be ready to pick yourself up and, and, and run. When you go to play rugby, you don't say, I'm not going to fall down, not fight with somebody. You prepare for rugby. That's how business is, and it's a great game, rugby. Me, I'm a small guy, but I'm a great rugby player. In business, <laughs> I thank you all. I thank NSF and all the partners. I'm a big rugby fan and used to play, so Patrick, that was a good way to end. So we're closing now. Um, it, is, it is only fair that when we have representatives from government, we, we know that government is supporting this program. So uh, Patrick Mugisha, the Commissioner for uh, Ministry of Science, Innovation and Technology, please say a few words, five minutes, and then I'll invite Patrick to, to close the session. Thank you very much. Uh, all protocol observed. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank NSSF, MasterCard Foundation, Outbox, and all other partners for this important initiative. Anything to do with innovation, that's part of uh, what drives me. Patrick Mugisha is my name, but can call me Mugi. That's what in the innovation space everyone knows me. It's a trademark, by the way. So it's not just um, uh, an acronym or something like that. I work with the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation, I'm the Commissioner in Charge of Innovations and Intellectual Property Management. I'm a chemist by background and uh, also intellectual property law practitioner. Um, I want to thank the organizers for this program because what you want to address is something that government is also passionate about. And I think as a, uh, one of my admirers and uh, someone who's look up to Mr. Patrick Pitature, as you say that at times government is fighting, does not trust the banks, the banks don't trust the customers. So we just need this kind of engagement to bring us together. And uh, on the issue of ideas uh, being stolen, I think there are clear frameworks how we can be able to address this issue. And I think for NSSF to really reap big in this kind of engagement is that uh, IPs are going to emerge from uh, high technology based kind of interventions. But also by the time you're in business, whether you're selling um, a software like Abraham or something like that, you need a trademark to really differentiate you from what others are doing in the same space. So I think working with this program, we shall also be able to give you that technical support that you really require as businesses uh, to be able to identify where is the IP. Most of the innovators in Uganda today, they want to hold ideas in their armpits. You find there's actually no IP, but someone says, I think I have a patent, you have a patent, but where is it? The moment you engage them, there is no patent in that. So I think it's also an issue of uh, awareness for them to appreciate. When I talk of IP, what is it? When I want to talk about innovation value chain, what is it involved in? And I think that will give you a better kind of a footing for you to make sure that uh, you move forward. So as a Minister of Science, the and Innovation, I think there's a lot you're going to support. And by the way, one of our mandates is to facilitate the acquisition of intellectual property assets. So basically, you come as an innovator, uh, like for this program, and say 100 innovators have come. I think they've got um, 100 potential IPs that they need to register. For us, we can facilitate that process because as government, uh, that's what we are supposed to call, uh, uh, we're asked to do, and we can support that on that framework. So I think there are many things you're going to be able to work together. And these things don't leave out government because when it comes to actually now buy-in and scalability, you'll need us. So let us work from the inception and then we see how we make this. 
uh, sustainable. Then manufacturing, agribusiness, a lot is going to happen. Standards, compliance. Someone is going to make that nice pineapple juice, but you'll never go to the shelves of these supermarkets when you don't have that quality mark. How are you going to leverage on that? Partnerships. Thank you. God bless. All right. In a very interesting thing. If you remember, there have been four Patricks on this podium today. There was Patrick Biarugaba. Maybe many of you think he's just Richard. He's also called Patrick Biarugaba. There was Patrick Bitature. There's Patrick Mogisha. There is me. So maybe for some of you who are struggling, what you need to name your kids. Eh? <laughs> We've not patented it. You won't go wrong with Patrick or Patricia. So we've covered both ends. Uh, thank you guys for really uh, being here. I think the message to Ugandans out there, let's be bold. Let's try it out. When you read stories about people like um, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, these were actually at the university when they started those ideas, and they were bold enough to take it. They finished the university later. I'm not saying drop out of the university, but they were bold enough to believe in their own idea that they came out. And the Ugandans, we know we are so scared that you think uh, my, my idea is mine. What we found out is this, and I think uh, uh, Sam alluded to it. Your idea is only going to grow as big as you are. So if you want to make it bigger, it has to be more than you to make it bigger. So let's not just hold. Don't own 100% of zero. Be willing to own 40% of a billion shillings. You are much more ahead. So those are things that we are learning along. So please be bold so that we can actually, and try it out. Don't be in the corner saying, ah, I've had those people. No, try it out. You never know. Lady smile may just smile on your side. And finally, thank you for your coming. Thank you, MasterCard. I think you've been one amazing uh, here. Thank you, Patrick, for that coffee. We didn't know where it would go, but here we are. And I think it gives us a chance. Thank you for all our partners, the financial partners. Stanbeek, you trusted us enough to come aboard. UDB, Equity, uh, AB Trust. And then especially our hubs. The heartbeat of this is really our incubation hubs. You are close to those businesses and really want to make sure that you can actually deliver these businesses, the quality ideas. So please, thank you a lot. Outbox, you've been amazing. And then the team within NSF that has worked. We have Exco team members who are very supportive. We have got our CS there. Thank you, Agnes. All our legal challenges, she tries to solve them for us because some things we have no idea what to do. And she's actually stepped up into doing, helping us that. We've got our uh, friend in ops. We've got, I know some of them were here. I may have left them. Then for the team that actually do this, let me just thank them. Ah, there is our head of IT. By the way, Joan is back there, head of IT. You can look at her. You may think she's 19 or 18, but she's our head of IT department. <laughs> so just because... We believe in young people in the NSF. We actually believe. Some of us are dinosaurs. We are dying away very quickly. But we think that there is a future in the young people. And then we have a team that actually has put this together, uh, headed by Alex. We've got Robert. We've got... Uh, we, okay, please, the NSF team that organizes this, just please stand up. Let's give you, because you guys have worked for one year without... Yeah, they are back there. And they come in all shades and uh, shifts. I can see Julian... Guys, thank you. So this is not the end. This is the beginning. Thank you very much. And God bless you. Have a good trip. Thanks.